crisis was born right after or during the last phase of Far Cry. For me it was about, well the first reaction was I have enough of jungles. That was only the first reaction for about a couple of minutes. And I said no, I'm not done actually with it yet. So I went to uh, one of our art directors and went to Magnus. Shabbat described it pretty, uh, pretty close. He said, I want a jungle scene. It should be in the sunrise. You should see inside a sphere that is frozen inside and there's a alien ship. That was basically the criteria. After like a half day, he came back to me and I said, like this? And I said, yeah, that's fantastic. I wanted to make a hero where the player at any moment can change his tactic to survive any given situation. So the player constantly has to adapt to survive in a way he wants to apply his tactics, he wants to overcome the enemy, and he wants to use the environment to overcome the enemy. He wanted two things. Number one is to establish a hero who is visually uh, different from anything that's on the market today. And the reason number two is that as, as the game developed, as we played it, uh, we figured out that it would be cool to have different abilities according to the situation. So the nano suit was born, where he can change his speed, strength, armor, and go to cloak if needed. The concept of the suit was one of the biggest odysseys in the whole process, because originally we didn't have it. So in the beginning, the player used to start with a normal, super advanced, modern soldier Delta Force kind of uniform without any special features. And later on, he used to upgrade to some armor, just big tank looking guy. We talked a lot about Japanime and, you know, Japanese anime and, and using that and saying, okay, or comic books and saying, well, if I'm going to jump up in strength mode, how, how am I going to look when I do that? You know, am I just going to look like I'm jumping or am I going to have this cool Batman type pose? So we, we went for the Batman pose. The nano suit brought another challenge actually to the level design because with those enhanced abilities, you know, if the player suddenly can make three meter high jumps, if he can run 30 meters in just a couple of seconds, you have to really think differently about your level design. And now really I play on other games and I find myself wanting to do like nano sprint and it's not there and I'm just like, oh, this game kind of, this isn't fun now. <laughs> The big goal about the Aliens of Crisis was always to define a benchmark. We spend more time and money and resources ever in one creature than probably the entire budget of Far Cry. Aliens, we have so many concepts for aliens, I couldn't even count them, I think hundreds, yeah. literally. Reference-wise, we looked a lot at underwater little strange fishes and creatures. We can't just have this one kind of alien um, engagement or this, this, this kind of threat. We have to have uh, different kinds of aliens and they all should provoke you to a different kind of gameplay. Look different, feel different, do something different. All those different creatures together should be this interesting alien um, involvement. Reality is, for me, a means of accepting, of buying in of the gamer. The average age statistically shown is about 25 years old now, today. And they're much more academic or smarter than they were 10 years ago. So ultimately, they have expectations which have become bigger and bigger and bigger. For that matter, more real, more real, more real. Crisis is unsurpassed in terms of its visual quality. Uh, you won't see anything like Crisis um, on the market for some time. And Crytek are well known for uh, producing incredible graphics and um, you know, all the things that go with that in terms of the realism of the game. We have leaves that have light scattering through them with perfect shadowing and everything. We have a uh, very, very good dynamic light system. Everything breaks in this game. We have motion blur, so basically depth of field all the features, all the things that a real camera has. 
it's really amazing to see like a real time rendered ocean that Tiago is working on and just go, <laughs> is he watching a Pixar film? Like, what is it? I mean, to see stuff that's being rendered at 60 frames a second that looks comparative to stuff that I've seen in film is just really, I would say, breathtaking. When we did Far Cry, we made the more the idea of what a jungle should look like. And this time, this, the goal was to make a real one. The most fun part about the research process was that we got to fly to Tahiti. I mean, we photographed every single piece of leaf, rock, vegetation, whatever we found on this island, everything. We got to feel how things relate to each other, how they grow, how the palm trees look like. How the leaves get affected by looking at the sun through the leaf. If you manage to, to do that, get, get the little things right, uh, you get a very good sense of immersion for players. One example which used to be used very, very broadly in games is, for example, lens flares on cameras which isn't something you see in real life. If you walk around, you don't see lens flare. But the visual impact of that feels real to the player. Initially, we set the direction, we said we want to be as photoreal as possible, or for that matter, video real as possible, but also be as interactive as possible. And our technology team, our CryEngine team, sat back and you cannot have both directions. You have to either go photoreal or more interactive. And, uh, I said, no, I want both. I did compromise, said, let's try to get both. It's like, okay, um, yeah, we're gonna do everything, and we want it to look amazing. And it's like, okay, well, that's gonna be a little difficult. And then after almost like one and a half years, I see the first tree ever break in this company. It doesn't sound like a big deal to have a tree breaking in computer graphics, but the thing is the tree looked super real, but then when you shoot it, it started breaking exactly where I shot it and it fell over realistically. In gaming, that's a major achievement. And from, for that moment when this happened, two extreme directions we had in mind actually came together. The only problem was back then, it was only one tree. And we said, now we have to be able to destroy every tree in the world. challenge in, in um, uh, creating such an open environment and actually uh, crafting an experience for the player which is so open and environment which is so free is actually very complicated. Complete freedom is confusing so you have to provide a certain guidance to players because they don't want you know to stand somewhere and have no clue what's going on. At one point you always have to like close that bow, you know, you have this open space, but at one point, again, you want to have the story um, still move on. Then maybe open the section up a little more. You want the job? You got it! They want some kind of, you know, guidance, being told that if you go in that direction, the most exciting thing will happen. You can go there as well, that's fine. You give freedom, and at the same time you give uh, you make it attractive enough that players will actually do the things you would like them to do. So while designing the levels, um, the big direction that we're giving about the level designs has been always to make sure that the term Veni Vidi Vici is used in their minds. Um, Veni Vidi Vici in terms of I come, I see and I conquer is an anatomy, a three steps of the minds of the gamer. Every level of the game is designed with player being able to approach the challenge, observing it, and then overcoming it. Not just this action game, you run around, you don't think, you just pull your trigger and shoot. I think we really would want the player be engaged on an intellectual basis as well. The way we, we do it in Crisis is about letting the player outsmart the enemy. Usually aliens tend to be very stupid and very, well, one-dimensional. Di one and we gave them a multi-dimensional navigation, but also we gave them senses like hearing and seeing. As we did with the human AI with Far Cry. At the Far Cry times, all we had was basically all the characters were walking on the surface or a vehicle was drawing on the ground. So we had to build this technology which allows us to make the AI navigate in total 3D environments. 
and then we ran into the funny situation that you could pick up the top of a tree and hold it in front of you, which sort of hides you from the AI. And then we had to teach these guys that, you know, if there's suddenly a tree in the middle of the road, it might be something fishy going on. Then we had to tell them that trees normally don't move. So if a tree moves, it might be that the player is hiding behind it. We told work with EA on this, we said to our EA partners, we need a visual benchmark on this game. We need something that showcases crisis without having it yet. And so we created this video, which we call Corex Video. Initiate. We worked with a CGI studio in, in Hollywood called Blur Studios. And we said, make it as strong and as cool looking as you can get, because we will match you in real time. And they said, mm, are you sure we can use everything? Motion blur, everything, depths of field? I said, yeah, go wild. And so they created the video. One year later, we already catch up. Two years later, today, we actually surpassed that video even. Technologically, I think our R&D department is the finest in the world, basically. They managed to do things which everybody tells them are not uh, possible to do. We have developed a whole new engine for Christ because of its needs. We're simulating environments like the alien ship, which is not possible with traditional, like with traditional what? engines. I just lost gravity. I'm using thrusters to stabilize myself. This is going to take some getting used to. CryEngine 2 had to be created for that reason, one of the major reasons. If it would have been visible from the beginning on, I think we would have not undertaken crisis. It would have been just too big. But you have to be careful that you don't, you know, innovate for innovation's sake. There are some things you should, where you should stick to the basics. We always try to find the most pragmatic, the simplest answer to something, but we still really think about it from all angles and try to come up with the best thing. Hey, Nomad, you still with us? our facial uh, motion capture system. We talked about that at GDC and some people were like, you guys use eyeliner and it takes 10 minutes, you know, in a webcam and we use like a $50 webcam and it seems pretty ghetto, but at the same time, it worked pretty well. To get the sound of the alien itself, we used um, a bunch of weird latex sort of squishy balls that you would, you know, you use to, they're stress release balls or something like that. And you just, we would pour a bunch of uh, liquid soap into them roll them around in our hands and get these visceral, sort of disgusting sounds. For us, risk, we see risk as opportunity. Um, and other people see risk as um, a problem or a, a, a point of failure. You believe this? And we don't do many games. Every two, three years, one game coming out. So we have to do every two years something exceptional just to increase the company uh, reputation. Something's here. I think EA knew what we were getting into when we first started working with, uh, with Crytek. They do have a very um, forward-thinking way of, uh, of development um, and they do love to sort of push the boundaries of what's possible. We were the first adopter on DX10, we were the first adopter on Windows Vista and that is basically all extreme, I mean that was extremely risky and extremely uh, problematic to develop. We developed on beta software, on operating system, we developed on uh, alpha beta hardware which was actually extremely problematic because we needed to throw away a lot of work basically. Of course, between a developer and a publisher there's always friction. If there wouldn't be friction, you would say, nobody cares really. But I would even argue as more friction there is, as more people care about what they do. I think this game will have a big impact on, on the marketplace. There have been other very successful and fantastic games out there in the genre, but I think Crisis will make people think about what the structures of first-person shooters should be. Crytek's culture of 
pushing and innovation and redefining things inherently means that it's going to be very difficult for the future because we need to top ourselves again. And it means also dealing with new technologies and always with new innovation. Yeah, that I'd like to see. Good thing is the gamers will always get great products, hopefully.